water in a, in a medicine dropper and you squeeze a little drop out. The little drop, you know, hangs onto the end of the medicine dropper. Uh, the skin around the water molecule, water molecules are really sticking together and it takes a fair amount of weight. You got to get a big enough drop out there for it to break through that skin and begin to flow out of the medicine dropper. Uh, on the other hand, ether. Uh, you know, when you're, uh, we use ether to anesthetize fruit flies for genetic experiments. And in the old-fashioned way, you take a medicine dropper and stick it in a bottle of ether and then squirt the ether, you know, into a little chamber where the fruit flies were. And you'd think it was a bad technique, you know. Of course, I get kind of a kick out of watching the students do this. You put the medicine dropper in the ether and dribble, 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 you know, ether all the way across <laughs> the other side. Ether doesn't have hardly any cohesion. It, the, the molecules don't stick together at all. And if you, you know, suck them up in a medicine dropper, just pull the medicine dropper up. You don't push on it, just pull it up. You know, it just drops right on through. And so it's really hard to transfer it uh, because of that. Well, water is strong enough to do this. And so that's part of God's overall plan. The system wouldn't work if it weren't for the chemical cohesiveness, the stickiness of water molecules. And it only works when you've got uh, dry enough air. Well, what about tropical plants where there's not that much dry air? Uh, they actually have to spend energy. I know plants living with a sufficiently dry atmosphere, they get water transport for free. All they got to do is keep the membranes alive. They were going to be keeping them alive anyway. And water at the top of the redwoods is free. No energy expended in particular to move that water. It's flowing down with energy going. Well, in tropical plants or in Florida plants where the humidity hovers around 100% <laughs> a lot of the year, they actually have little machines in the membrane, uh, active transport enzymes that specifically use chemical energy to pump the water out. And the water forms little beads and there are actually little spots on the leaf that pump the water out. Otherwise, the plant would be living in stagnant water. And plants that can't do that can't grow in the, in the tropics. Uh, so this uh, you know, decides where plants are going to grow. And so there's a lot involved. And it, it, again, it's based on you know water going to the top of the tallest tree is flowing down in energy. You know, that just, uh, uh, you know, God's capitalizing on chaos, a system designed to harness a natural tendency uh, to achieve a most unnatural, supernatural uh, end. Uh, speaking of end, <laughs> maybe that, since I did look down at my watch, maybe that's a good idea. <laughs> the, uh, although, you know, I wouldn't want to disappoint you since you came out on the cold night. <laughs> but uh, this applies to a variety of things. There's another application to plants I won't say anything about. But I think I'll add one more little thing, if you don't mind. Uh, now, I guess I've talked already about nerve impulses, but this also applies to, see if you can tell me what this is. See as I get it right side up. Okay. I uh, hope I don't have this. Down here what it is. Okay. Uh, as soon as you recognize what this is, you'll know, raise your hand. Available now, linear motor, rugged and dependable, designed, optimized by worldwide field testing. Uh, over an extended period. All models offer the economy of fuel cell type energy conversion and will run on a wide range of commonly available fuels. <clears throat> Low standby power but can be switched within milliseconds to as much as one kilowatt mechanical energy per kilogram peak dry conditions. A modular construction and wide range of available subunits permit tailor-made solutions to otherwise intractable mechanical problems. Anybody know what we're talking about yet? I can see in one hand. One and a half? One and three quarters? Okay. A uh, choice of two control systems. One, externally triggered mode, versatile general purpose units, digitally controlled by pipe-dual pulses. Despite low input energy uh, level, very high signal-to-noise ratio, energy amplification one million approximate. Uh, mechanical characteristics for the one centimeter module, uh, maximum speed optional between uh, 0.1 and 100 millimeters per second, stress generated 2 to 5 times 10 to the minus 5th newtons per meter squared. Two, autonomous mode. Anybody know what we're talking about yet? Are there any more people? <laughs> uh, made with interval oscillators. Uh, it's getting kind of hard to read the glare here. <laughs> 
especially suitable for pumping applications. Modules available with frequency and mechanical impedance appropriate for A, solids and slurries, uh, B, liquids, uh, lifetime, uh, 2.6 times 10 or 2.6 billion operations, typical 3.6 billion maximum, uh, independent of frequency. Uh, for gases, it can uh, do 50 to 1,000. Many optional extras, built-in servo, length of velocity, uh, where fine control is required, direct piping of oxygen, thermal generation, etc. And it's good to eat. Okay. <laughs> And yeah, who knows what that is? What? Who wants to say? A flagella motor? That's a good guess. And a flagella motor will be part of this, but this is even more common than that. There's a lot of it in this room. There's an awesome amount of it in front of me right now. Well, maybe not. <laughs> what were you thinking? It is a cell, but it's a special kind of cell. Mitochondria? Uh, it requires a lot of mitochondria to make it work. And it's a lot bigger than a bacterial cell. And it's something that can pump uh, fluids or gases uh, and uh, or fluid, yeah, fluids, <laughs> gases or liquids, I guess. Uh, it's something that can, uh, yes? A new gas, a heart. This is the heart, okay, that's the autonomous mode. Okay, and so what's being described here is a muscle cell. <laughs> and can you imagine, read this you know, to an evolutionist and say, you know, how did this happen by chance? Well, you, know, you moron, this didn't look at all the design and engineering you went into this. Obviously, this didn't happen by chance. And then they get to this bottom, good deep, what's that? <laughs> and so, I mean, this is, you know, just awesome. You know, if you had a, a factory that could, you know, handcraft and put out these little things on a regular basis, wow. So you can get it to, you know, these pumping offs, uh, they're autonomous. You know, they have an internal circuit, you know, like the heart beats uh, up to 3.6 billion times, you know, without stopping. That's pretty good. Uh, by the way, anybody know which one of them is for pumping slurries? That's a nice way of saying the digestive system in the colon. <laughs> so, pumping sludge through the digestive system. <laughs> or moving air in and out of lungs that could, you know, pump gases. And then here, externally triggered modes. That's the ones you know, under control of voluntary muscles. You can move your fingers. And notice the real high signal to noise ratio, very fine control, like the, the movements of your eye muscles, you know, are just incredibly you know, just little teeny effects, you know. And then you got big muscles, you know, with big broad effects and so on. So all of that is a muscle. Okay. And uh, here's a little diagram. Uh, you know, this would be like a, a diagram, you know, of a bicep or something like that. And here are the muscles, you know, wrapped up in some connective tissue. And they come in bundles of fibers. And so these fibers are thick and thin filaments uh, that say these are the ends of a, one of the, the sections. And the filaments slide together and the muscle contracts. The filaments move apart, the muscle relaxes. And so all of the muscle, including the heart muscle, you know, it's just filaments sliding together, moving apart. And here it shows it down here in the bottom. Uh, the thick and the thin filaments just pull together and push apart. And uh, what does that, uh, you know, here's a close up of, of uh, uh, muscle fiber. Um, <laughs> in a minute, maybe, okay. And so here are these thick and thin filaments. They're little bridges. Uh, one of the thick filaments are made of myosin molecules that look like golf clubs. And they attach to the thin filaments like this. And then on cue, they bend in. And they pull the thin filaments in. And they let go, grab again, pull forward. And they'll let go, grab again, pull forward. And uh, what triggers all that, this is getting back to the, the topic. So here are these muscle filaments surrounded by this uh, sort of pinkish stuff here uh, is a sac, a calcium sac, with a fancier name, sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, but muscles, uh, and there's two, but muscles require calcium to work. And so here you have these little bridges ready to go, but there's uh, uh, something between uh, the, uh, uh, you know, blocking the contact between the bridge and, so nothing happens until you get this little thing out of the way. 
then bridge contact is made and the motion occurs. Well, it's calcium that gets a little blocker out of the way. And so the calcium is then stored in these sacs. And so you trigger a nerve impulse, triggers a muscle to contract, dumps a chemical on it that's carried right next to the sac, and causes the membrane to release all this calcium. And so the calcium moves the blocker out of the way, and the little filaments start working like crazy to uh, contract the muscle. But as soon as the calcium is released, it starts diffusing back into the sac, and there are enzymes that grab it and pull it back in. So again, it's all timed just right to make this work. So this is something I used to you know, do with the students. So here's a little, uh, here's a, a thin film, and here's a thick film with this little golf club on it, and ready to make this contact. And so as soon as you get a nerve impulse that makes an electrical wave over the membrane, it releases calcium. Uh, and then that calcium moves a little blocker out of the way. And when the blocker is moved out of the way, the, the head tilts and pulls the filaments forward, and then it releases. But when it pulls it forward, it winds it up with the next head six molecules down. And so that one can pull while the first one is recovering. So it's like a very coordinated rowing team <laughs> in three dimensions. So this is kind of wild. Uh, and then, of course, the calcium begins to come back. As soon as the calcium is all gathered up again, then the muscle relaxes. And so then you have to stimulate it over if you want that to go on. So even at this, and the, the controls are exceedingly tight, the, the motion imparted by one contraction is five times the diameter of a hydrogen atom. And so when your muscle, talk about fine tuning, you know, each little contraction motion is just five times the diameter of a hydrogen atom. And the control is all based on diffusion and diffusion time and coordinating uh, to match the needs of the system. Wow! <laughs> so it's not just plant power, but our power depends on the power of the living God. Well, let me stop there then and give you uh, time for questions on this or related topics. Uh, yes, uh, congratulations, by the way. <laughs> I was wondering, is any of the calcium lost in that process, or does it all go back into the sac? Most all of it goes back into the sac. I, I'm sure that over time, a little bit of calcium may be lost, but I, I don't think very much. Uh, there's calcium loss from the body uh, in other processes, so you need to have calcium in your diet on a regular basis. Uh, and I suppose maybe some of it you know, doesn't quite make it back, but it, it'd have to leak out of the cell entirely or get in the way. So it has to be pulled up, otherwise the muscle would contract and stay, uh, stay contracted. And so I, I think, but very little of it escapes there. Uh, you know, we do get some calcium loss. We do need to have calcium replenished in our diet, uh, but uh, very little of it lost right there at that level. Yes? On, on the biosphere, they had this enclosure where they had trees. Mm -hmm. And because the trees were not affected by the wind, they had, ended up dying because they just didn't have that constant uh, requirement to, you know, like a muscle, if you don't use it, it dies. Oh. So I don't know, I'm not sure how this fits with, apparently the muscle has to be in vibration otherwise it dies too, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. It, uh, use it or lose it, so to speak. <laughs> and <laughs> I may be a living example of that. <laughs> and unused muscles actually lose fibers. And so the thick and thin filaments, the actin, the mice, and fibers deteriorate. They, you know, they disappear. You have fewer fibers per bundle, fewer bundles per muscle. And then the, the, it can fill in with fatty tissue or connective tissue. Uh, and it's kind of hard to replace if you lose a cell altogether. Usually when you bulk up, uh, someone was reasonably healthy, you know, they exercise and their muscles really increase, you're actually usually increasing the size of the individual cells, not increasing the, the number of cells, but you're increasing the number of fibers per cell. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, the things that are, you know, the calcium sacs and all that develop at the same time, you know, so it remains a coordinated set. Uh, and so uh, I guess that would be the case. You need to keep using these things or they might lose some of their abilities. 
uh, wind stress on plants can be very helpful uh, in uh, stimulating growth and maintaining a certain kind of growth. Uh, and it influences a little wind is very helpful in the, you know, moving water up through the plant. It increases evaporation rates from leaves a lot. And so if there was very little of that, uh, the plant would wind up, in a sense, with stagnant water. It wouldn't get a fresh supply of water and minerals. And as we're using up the minerals available to it, uh, might uh, tend to die. I hadn't heard that part about that, uh, but I'm, I'm not surprised now that you mention it. Uh, another question or comment? Yes, in the back there. So, so what you're saying in nature, just as human beings, any stress or challenge we have, it makes us stronger, it makes the plant stronger? Oh, it really does. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, uh, the some of you, let's see, I was trying to think of a good example of that. Uh, but uh, uh, I guess I can't think of it. It's in the back of my mind. But, uh, you know, you can take too good a care of plants and you can over-fertilize them with this and they get real spindly and weak and, you know, basically you have to hold them in your arms <laughs> to keep them alive. Well, breathe a little carbon dioxide on them. <laughs> uh, whereas if you get out, uh, uh, you know, they're experiencing some of the, uh, you know, stress uh, forces of wind and the alternating periods of wet and dry in the soil. Uh, you know, actually build a firmer, solid, you know, more functional unit. Uh, so I guess there, there probably be some spiritual analogies. Uh, you know, the spiritual growth. I, that was never my favorite part of the Bible. <laughs> How spiritual growth, you know, often depends on meeting and overcoming and and having the Lord lead you through, you know, times of spiritual stress. Uh, you're actually, you know, spiritually the better for it, even though at least the Bible is realistic. And says that no trial is uh, is enjoyable at the time, even though it may have a beneficial effect in the long run. Yes. Um, there's a passage that says tribulation works patience or endurance. Yes. It's, it's in the New Testament. It's not very pleasant, but that's I don't not like it at all. Yes, but it is there. I've, I've looked. I've tried to search the Dead Sea Scrolls and. See if maybe that was added later, but apparently not. No, no <laughs> not joking. I know it's there, <laughs> but I'm basically a wimp. And one of my lifelong prayers since I became a Christian, anyway, it was Lord help me to learn directly from reading, reading Your Word instead of having to experience all the bad stuff and learning it the hard way. <laughs> but sometimes there's benefit to, to really learning. And I've, I've, I've counseled friends that way. Sometimes people go through. Stuff that's you know, really hard for me to imagine how they, they go through it. But of course, that does enable them. It gives them a witness and a strength and a comfort to other people that nobody else could really be, among other things. That's one, uh, one benefit. Uh, another question or comment? Oh, oh yes. I just re realized part of what I was going to say I forgot because I didn't have a picture. Yes. I don't understand how this is an argument against evolution. Uh, the idea here is not really an argument against evolution so much as it's an argument for creation. In other words, the, uh, the evolutionist would be saying uh, basically their God is time and chance. And so, you know, chaos uh, produced cosmos. And that, that actually some uh, evolutionists have said it exactly that way. Uh, that chaotic random events. For a while there was a uh, oh, real what shall we say, jumping on the bandwagon, uh, Ilya Prigogine, this goes back to the time of my first creation evolution debate, he was making all headlines and the evolutionists were just lauding him and nominating for Nobel Prizes because uh, he showed how, you know, chaotic, you know, random processes like storms generated a certain amount of structure, like a hurricane. And they, these were called dissipative structures. And it was, wow, look at that, you know, just random stuff can generate order. That's what evolution is all about. There's no God. You don't need any God for this. Random chaos can make all the order you want if you wait long enough. But the name he gave them should have been a clue. You know, he called them dissipative structures. And they required a continuous high input of, air, of energy and the right raw materials. And of course, hurricanes blow themselves out. Tornadoes blow themselves out. Praise the Lord. <laughs> they can do a lot of damage in the meantime. 
uh, but they're not stable and they require an awful lot of uh, energy input. They tried to apply it to DNA in, in my very first debate. <laughs> I challenged Pregene to a debate in public refereed by biochemists if he thought that a random input of energy could organize DNA bases into a genetic code because it's just totally irrelevant, you know, and so, and, and it died. You know, I'd enjoyed a period of prosperity and praise from the evolutionists and it died out for exactly those reasons. You had to have all the raw materials there, you had to have a continuous input of high energy and all you got was a temporary flux uh, of some sort of order. And so here what we're looking at is an evolutionist could argue that, you know, at bottom, the heat motion of the universe is God. That's where the energy, that's where, you know, that's the bottom, that's the ultimate chaos, is that everybody agrees that in our universe, small particles are in a constant state of random motion. And therefore, you know, as I mentioned, random motion of particles will produce coordinated results, diffusion, moving things at, at a definite rate to a definite endpoint uh, in a definite direction. And then what I was saying is, yeah, but that destroys things unless you have a created structure that can harness that kind of energy and move it in the right direction to accomplish a goal. So that's the basic creation evolution point here. Yes, there is a lot of random chaotic motion at the atomic level, and God can use that to accomplish coordinated purposes but the coordinated purposes are not generated by the system itself, by the random motion, but by the system designed to capitalize on that chaos, to use that random energy in a particular way. And the constraints are tight. The distances have to be just right. The amounts have to be just right. Uh, take the nerve impulse, for instance. And so a nerve impulse, let's say here you have the nerve membrane, and on the outside of the membrane, uh, you have a net positive charge, and on the inside of the membrane, a uh, relatively negative charge, and that's established uh, by uh, the sodium-potassium pump. So there's a system of enzymes in the membrane, molecular machines are now being called commonly, uh, that pump out uh, uh, two, uh, two sodiums and bring in three potassiums. And so you wind up with a lot of potassium inside the nerve cell, so that the diffusion gradient for potassium is about 14 to 1. It has a tremendous tendency to diffuse out. The diffusion gradient for sodium is about 10 to 1 to diffuse in. And that's established first by having a membrane that's an insulator that can separate charge. And so if you're going to make a battery, in a sense that's a battery. So you've got a, you know, a plus and a minus pole on this battery. And you've got an insulator that keeps the charges from coming together normally. And so now you've got a, a situation set up, uh, you know, to, you can harvest some energy. You've got a battery, you can do something with this. Well, what are you going to do with it? Well, how about use it to transmit a nerve impulse? And, oh, I love this part. Years ago, okay, uh, I used to tell my students, you know, it, it's like there's a, a donut-shaped protein and donuts are one of my favorite subjects anyway. <laughs> There's a donut-shaped protein in the membrane uh, with a little lid over the hole. And that, that lid normally keeps sodium and potassium, it's too, it's too closed uh, to let sodium and potassium through. And it's really the surplus positive charges that kind of keep it, you know, fairly tightly sealed so the sodium and potassium can't get through. Well, I was just using it as a teaching model. Guess what? they found out there really are donut-shaped proteins that really do have a little lid on them. <laughs> and so what happens is you need something to trigger. You've got to open one of these sodium gates, they're called. And so that's usually something like acetylcholine. The nerve can dump this uh, chemical on it, and the chemical acts like a little grabber that grabs a door, you know, by the handle and pries the door open. Well, when the door opens, now sodium and potassium uh, are sized appropriately uh, to move through that opening. Who goes first? Well, you can hear the argument. Sodium says, oh, you know, you go first. No, you go first. Is it like Laurel and Hardy are both going to try to go through? No, it's, you think on the basis of diffusion, you'd say, well, potassium would, would go first because it's got a 14 times gradient. It would diffuse out before sodium would diffuse in. 
But then somebody else would say, well, wait a minute, potassium's bigger, it would diffuse slower. And then they say, well, sodium is smaller, but it holds two shields of hydrogen water molecules around it. So its diffusion weight is about the same as potassium. And so now you're back to potassium going out first, except what? It's plus on the outside, minus on the inside. So in addition to the straight diffusion gradient based on molecular size and concentration difference, there's an electrical gradient. And so the result is sodium goes in first. And so sodium and potassium diffuse at approximately the same rate. Potassium ought to go first, but because of the electrical gradient, sodium goes first. On average, of course, in reality, they're trading places like that. But on average, more sodium comes in. Well, what does that do? That wipes out the electrical gradient that allowed them to go first in the first place. And so now potassium, with its greater diffusion difference and comparable hydrated size, goes out. What does that do? That reestablishes the plus charges on the outside, closes the gate. And so that's the basic event in a nerve impulse. It's a little pulse. And so you have a polarized membrane, plus pole and a minus pole. And then you pry open the lid, you have a depolarization. The plus charges rush in uh, and uh, neutralize the, the neg net negative charge. And then some plus charges rush out, reestablish the plus charge and close the lid. But before they do that, that would just be a flick up and down. But there's another sodium gate over here at, guess what, just the right distance. Okay, with its lid closed, because it wasn't stimulated by that chemical. But when the plus charges flow in at this point, the plus charges holding this one closed, diffuse toward the first pore, so it opens up. So as this one is repolarizing, stopping the impulse, this one's depolarizing, continuing the impulse. And so a nerve impulse is carried kind of like a spark traveling down a fuse. And so you set fire to the fuse, and that fire lights the next part of the fuse, lights the next part of the fuse, lights the next part of the fuse, lights, and so the, the spark travels down the fuse. But a nerve membrane is alive, and so it's different from the fuse. You light the fuse, and the spark travels down, and the living membrane rebuilds the fuse. <laughs> So, so there's just a little spark and a new fuse come along right behind it. <laughs> so you get a wave of depolarization followed by repolarization. And the diffusion is phenomenal. It takes advantage of the hydrated size of the particles, the diffusion concentration differences. Uh, the net result of that, by the way, is that the transmission of a nerve impulse takes virtually no energy whatsoever. What's the bad news? You can think and you can think and you can think and you can study for exams and you can't lose a pound. <laughs> it's just not there. <laughs> you walk around the block, you know, you burn no energy. You think like crazy and nothing, you know, all the energy of studying for final exams is in half a peanut. Okay. <laughs> now, in a way, that's a little bit unfair because uh, the, the, the brain and the nervous system has high standby energy. And so it actually does take a lot of energy to keep the brain and the nerves alive. But you're, you have that anyway. And so all that extra thinking you do is burning no additional energy, very hard to small to measure. And then the number of molecules that trade places I, you know, are just, ooh, so, well, the number's high, but the percentage is extremely small. And so a given nerve impulse can carry, the typical nerve, now it varies with the individuals, but can carry hundreds or even thousands of impulses before so much sodium and potassium are traded in place that the pump has to recharge the membrane. Normally, you would never get to that point. You know, you'd have to uh, deliberately, you know, overstimulate a nerve to ever get to that point. And so it's just phenomenal. Diffusion works all the way along the way at, at multiple points uh, to make a, a system work. So the evolutionists would say, see, I told you so. It's all a matter of chaotic motion. And the average person, the average thinking person, the creation would say, you know, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, just a random diffusion of sodium with potassium isn't going to do any of that. You know, you have to have all that structure and all that spacing and all that size difference and all, you know, all of that you know, has to be set up ahead of time before you can use uh, that otherwise random. Again, uh, sodium doesn't say, oops, 
you know, it's time for a nerve impulse. I gotta hurry, you know, pardon me, I gotta go in, you know, ah, now it's my, no, they're, they're just bouncing around at random and responding to the local conditions. But the system has been designed to generate, uh, you know, this phenomenally coordinated event. So again, it's a system uh, that, that gets the credit and the designer of the system, not the random chaotic. <laughs>